many people think, um, especially those who read and learn about all at school and college, through the prism of his dystopian uh, novel, uh, 1984, that he was just writing about what is called uh, totalitarianism, um, and this is very much how it's represented. This isn't wrong, uh, but it's only slightly right. So I want to take a quick look at what totalitarianism was, and what Orwell was really worried about, as well as the dicta uh, dangers of dictatorship, and, and primarily why, why words uh, are important. Words, writing, and speech, and how we use them are more important than anything else, anything else. Word and, words and language define and express uh, meaning. To lose control of words uh, and language is to lose control of meaning, your meaning. So listen up. Words, writing, and speech are more important than anything else. Anything. Now, all I saw this uh, clearly and vividly way ahead of his time. Uh, and nothing else is more important. So first of all, let's take a look at totalitarianism, which was very much part of the world um, for uh, Orwell in his historical period in terms of Nazism, uh, Second World War, and, and Stalin, especially Stalin's Soviet Union. The important thing to note about totalitarianism is that while a conventional dictatorship um, merely restricts or crushes freedom of all, freedom and autonomy in the interests of upholding a state or a class. It did not, before dictatorship, did not, before the Stalinists and Nazis, seek to abolish the basis of freedom and autonomy itself. So totalitarians <clears throat> sought to change the nature of the human soul in the sense of social engineering by the use of dictatorial powers, uh, incredible violence sometimes, to change or abolish the basis for autonomy uh, itself, which is people. How they think and live, how they talk, the words they use, the language they use. The mission of the totalitarian was to eliminate the role of freedom by assaulting the boundaries, um, uh, especially um, the distinction between um, public or official um, and private and intimate sphere, self-interest, premises, the premise of autonomy and self-determining differentiation uh, of, of individuals. When I say self-determining uh, differentiation, it's terrible. All well will be horrified. Mm -hmm. What I mean is the capacity of people to form their own associations and clubs. It might be chess, it might be pigeon mm -hmm. fancy, uh, it might be trade unions, it might be um, a, a political party, but there is an innate characteristic we have in free societies of, in a self-determining way of differentiating ourselves um, uh, through groups into classes or even nations. In the 1930s, totalitarianism emerged as the driving force in Nazi Germany, which was emulating and outstripping uh, Stalinism, which had adopted uh, this mission in Stalin's attempts um, to consolidate uh, his control of the Bolshevik state. In the West, in free societies, without dictatorship, similar trends uh, are identified by um, Orwell in the run-up uh, to the Second World War, and certainly and the period uh, afterwards. And he saw this as emerging within the intellectual currents that defined politics, universities, the people who are often self-styled guardians of literature and journalism. Orwell was worried not just about the Sovietization of Europe via Stalinist parties, these were mass parties that came close and sometimes won elections, and their fellow travellers, uh, the Europeanised left, uh, the worship state power, particularly in a supranational form, was a very important insight for Orwell, whether that was the British Empire, the Roman Curia of the Vatican, or the USSR. But what he was worried about was the infection, the risk, the infection of a totalitarian uh, mindset that would become uh, damaging uh, to freedom. This is also um, seen as a real danger by people like Arendt in the United States. Um, and not just to freedom, but more profoundly than that, to the deeper structures of the mind and even feeling. So he was worried about the susceptibility of many in free societies um, to this totalitarian outlook, this outlook of social engineering. The vehicle for this mindset and the infection is ideology, especially those outlooks associated with imperialism, supranationalism, or communism, with power over people instinct 
to make the people in the image of the intellectual's view um, of the world. This impulse tends to pit itself very quickly against the common culture and life of the people with a drive to achieve power over mankind, to socially engineer the souls, make people fit or comply with imperatives that lie above or outside their lived experiences or choices. Here, language and words become critical, as they were for totalitarians, in fact. In post-war, meritocratic, university-educated elites increasingly sought to socially engineer meaning. This new elite is perhaps better described as a clerisy, a class of rulers defined by education particularly, um, with a social base of political characteristics and training um, founded in, in modern higher education rather than traditional forms of privilege and wealth, such as public schools. This social base is, is, is important. It's worth noting that apart from his time at school at Eton, Orwell did not attend uh, university, and his style was very much uh, defined through politics and English language against the output of academia. This hostility was mutual uh, and remains so uh, in, in many uh, respects. In this world, reality becomes the fact of power expressed through a language of orthodoxy, of conforming, conforming to an outlook, not how people live or want to live. And when I say power, I mean usually administrative decisions to cancel speakers or articles, uh, to jeopardise people's jobs or career paths or promotion, or to stir up a witch hunt or hysteria, a hate session. As, as a world described them in, in 1984. We can see this very strongly in contemporary debates over words uh, and language. I mean, look at the word uh, patriotism. This was already becoming a, a suspect term in Orwell's day, uh, what he called the Europeanized left, who he wrote to take the cookery from Paris and their opinions from Moscow. He wrote, in the general patriotism of the country, they form a sort of island in, of distant fort. England is perhaps the only great country whose intellectuals are ashamed of their own nationality. He wrote this 80 years ago, over 80 years ago, in 1941, as Britain faced the war of national survival, where the ascendant, meritocratic, left-leaning uh, political caste um, was actually anti-patriotic. In left-wing circles, he wrote, it has always felt that there is something slightly disgraceful with being an Englishman. And it is a duty to snigger at every English institution, um, from horse racing to suet pudding. So you can very much see that that outlook is basically the outlook of, of, of the particularly the media, press, chattering classes. It's very much a project of the Guardian um, or, or Channel 4. And today, after generations, this outlook has become dominant. To call oneself a patriot now would be to cancel yourself. No one would even listen to you, I don't think. You'd be seen as a fascist, as were most British voters in 2016 after the Brexit vote. Fascist is a pejorative um, that has lost all meaning, and Orwell charted this, this well, and he located it um, in, in, in one of his greatest books after 1984, Homage to Catalonia, with a Stalinist tendency to call Spanish democratic uh, revolutionaries Trotsky fascists. So even in the 30s and 40s, uh, Orwell could see a trend growing into a powerful ideology and one that would define itself against the nation, the national, the patriotic, that is, um, the, uh, the people. And perhaps we can talk about it um, in the discussion. If you look at the contemporary sort of trans debate, um, I, I mean, Orwell would find that you know, bizarre, um, but he would see it very much almost like a satirical culmination of some of these trends uh, that we're talking about. I, I, perhaps later on I can. We can refer to some of the elements in, in 1984 that actually pre, prefigure this uh, discussion. So this is a rule not defined not with a boot stamping on a human face dictatorship, but beginning with an indifference to defending freedom, particularly free speech. It then becomes an order defined through a culture of intolerant conformism, often posing uh, as radical sniggering at the patriots or orthodoxy around the use of words and language. So language looms largest in Orwell's most famous work, 1984, his best novel. He wasn't a good uh, novelist, he was a much better essayist, but 1984 is sublime. Take Ink, Sock and Newspeak 
in, in, in this uh, novel. Ingsoc is not a, a system of rules and style for English, or even the twists and turns of official language or the mainstream press. Uh, at times of war, when you don't talk about killing, you talk about collateral damage, you don't talk about shelling, you talk about kinetic strikes. That's not really what Orwell is talking about, that sort of weasel words, that long de bois. Um, it's an attempt to make certain ideas, freedom, autonomy, even independent for itself, actually unthinkable or impossible. It's a project that flourishes in 1984 in Big Brothers Britain, not just because of a dictatorship, in fact, not primarily because of a dictatorship, but because intellectuals, the chattering classes, the clerisy have given up on freedom. So it's a famous conversation between the novel's uh, anti-hero, um, arguably actually the villain, Winston Smith, and one of his uh, colleagues, Syme, who's responsible for, and they're both working on policing language and, 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 and developing this new speak uh, dictionary. And Syme famously disappears later on. Famously tells him the whole aim is to narrow the range of thought. In the end, we will make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every year, fewer and fewer words, and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we? Uh, are having. Now, in one of his earlier essays as well, Orwell talked about how, how the word free becomes hollowed out. It becomes like a, um, a cat being free of life. So the word free, a word can become sort of denatured, if you like, deracinated from its original uh, meaning to become entirely uh, empty and technical. So in a, in, a dicta in a dystopia of 1984, this was all shored up by dictatorship, secret police, violence and killing. There's little of that in our societies uh, today, thank goodness. But we do have a dominant culture that has given up on freedom and is very shrill on dissent from the orthodoxy nationalist power, for example. People are not disappeared, but they are cancelled, even arrested by police in some cases, or more common, uh, pushed out of jobs or isolated and shouted down. And it's this baleful trend, the closure of thought and the elimination of words and language by the, fact, the pressure of conformity that is the, the real heart of 1984. And it's this baleful influence that was all world's true fear. So writing in the Prevention of Literature 1946, very, very important essay, he saw that the biggest danger to free speech was not dictatorship, but in the longer term, turning away from freedom by, by intellectuals uh, particularly. Interestingly, his concerns were triggered by a 1944 meeting of the anti-censorship English pen um, organisation held during wartime, I think it was here, in fact, in this building, to mark the 300th anniversary of Milton's um, Areopagitica, the fame, his fame, that the famous 1644 speech making the case for the liberty of, of unlicensed uh, printing as the basics of the foundational moment in, in, in England, in, in Britain, for, for, for a free press. And all what was concerned, many present at the meeting were actually unwilling, certainly, to criticise Stalin's Soviet, uh, Russia, or wartime censorship, and were indifferent to the question of political liberty uh, and press freedom. He wrote, in England, the immediate uh, enemies of truthfulness and hence the freedom of thought of the press, lords, the film magnates, and the bureaucrats, but on a long view, the weakening of the desire for liberty among the intellectuals themselves is the most serious symptom of all he wrote. The essay is actually astonishing when you read it, um, looking, you know, looking back from the heights or the depths um, of where we are today. All one sees the real danger is not dictatorship, but, quote, the much more tenable and dangerous proposition that freedom is undesirable and that intellectual honesty is a form of antisocial uh, selfishness. This is a really big insight. The exercise of free speech and thought, the use of language to stand against tide of affairs or politics or orthodoxy, becomes something frowned upon, something selfish, something that is even elitist. People like Orwell arguing for free expression and our hero accused of either wanting to shut himself up in an ivory tower or of making an exhibitionist display of his own personality or of resisting the inevitable current of history in an attempt to cling to unjustified privilege.
Just think of the slogan today, check your privilege, but it's supposed to make people shut down or police their words before they're even uttered. Just think of the implications against contrarians, a, re a weasel word, who gratuitously upset how antisocial they are as they put themselves on the wrong side of history. How often do you get that said today? Now, this, this idea that free speech, that the use, the untrammeled use of words and language is, 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 is privilege is possibly the greatest lie of our age. Free speech is a realm of equality, of pure equality. It might actually be the only realm of pure equality. We all have words, all of us. All of us have the capacity to speak right, right, right think and argue. It is anything but an expression of unjustified uh, privilege. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear be famously wrote. History looms large in the new mindset. As Orwell wrote, a historian believes that the past cannot be altered and that a correct knowledge of history is valuable as a matter of course. From a totalitarian point of view, history is something to be created rather than learned. He described the growth of a ruling caste here in Britain that in order to keep its position has to be thought of as infallible, but since in practice no one is infallible, it is frequently necessary to rearrange past events in order to show that this or that mistake was not made or that this or that imaginary triumph actually happened. This tendency is dominate, dominant today. The past, like the nation, is regarded with suspicion as a source of error, especially of privilege, and history is something to be conjured up as a moral lesson um, for today. We no longer learn from history, but the past, or a rather self-serving version of it, is used to teach us about the correctness, the rectitude uh, of those uh, who dominate uh, today. In the prevention of literature, Orwell um, pondered the phase of prose literature. Um, he, he interestingly um, argued that actually poets and totalitarians coexist um, at, at that stage. Um, um, oh, oh, oh. So he, he, he was worried about it dying out um, because freedom as a mode of thinking was in danger. To write in plain, vigorous language, one has to think fear, fearlessly, he wrote. He was worried about the continued possibility of thinking fear, fearlessly, but his optimism in rescuing, preserving, and extending this facility is embodied in his work. He believed in the public as much as he believed in himself. And this is really critical because Orwell is everywhere. He's taught in schools, but invariably he's misrepresented. He's an old Etonian who rebelled against colonialism that was tainted by a colonialist and elitist outlook, let's say. Uh, he wrote about the dangers of dictatorship in the past. That's what I was taught at school, that revolutions and the rule of the mob would lead to the tyranny of Big Brother. Whereas his real significance is as a defender of freedom, especially free speech, as an exercise in the use of words and language. And this is his, his greatness. He meant it. His outstanding essay, Politics in the English Language, is actually a freedom manual. It's an instruction manual in how to use words and language to fight back against orthodoxy. Typically for our age, of course, it is intact as an expression of privilege of bigotry. He was an authoritarian elitist, argued Bill Self, um, the author uh, and commentator eight years ago, just for suggesting good ways of writing. He made an accusation against Orwell, which is well worth repeating what I'm finishing on, and strikes at the suspicion in which Orwell is held by people like Self, who are worried about his true stature and subversive powers. Self wrote in 2014, it was Orwell's own particular genius to possess a prose style stated a small number of things with plainful clarity. Reading Orwell at his most lucid, you can have a distinct impression he's saying these things in precisely this way because he knows that you and you alone are exactly the sort of person who's sufficiently intelligent to comprehend the very essence of what he's trying to communicate. It's this, the mediocrity English masses respond to. The talented dog whistler calling them to chow down on a big bowl of conformity. <laughs> Another much better writer and thinker, a cycle of Orwell's, Lionel Trilling, an American thinker, one of the best, is much underrated today, made the same point, actually, but better. Orwell liberates, as he wrote. 
He tells us that we can understand our political and social life merely by looking around us. He frees us from the need for inside dope. He implies that our job is not to be intellectual, certainly not to be intellectual in this fashion or that, but merely to be intelligent according to our own lights. He restores the old sense of the democracy of the mind, releasing us from the belief that the mind can only work in a technical, professional way, and it must work competitively. He has the effect of making us believe that we may become full members of the Society of Thinking Men, and that is why he's a figure for us. So I would just like to end by saying all well should be a figure for us too in our battle to restore the democracy of the mind. Thank you.